Right, yeah, so, so um, a storm event on a, on a 300 year return time, because that's what we are talking about, storms of that, free, that ferocity seem to return about every 300 years. But that's nowhere near enough to explain the kind of diversity in woodlands. But he gave a clue. And actually that clue is that it's just an example of one form of natural disturbance. There are many other forms of natural disturbance and they all work together to kind of be the counteracting force to vegetation succession. And the sort of things that also work in that work as natural disturbance agents are these great big beasts. Now these are from the Northern Hemisphere, so it's not just Britain, obviously, um, but it gives an idea of the size of the beasts that used to be roaming around in the Northern temperate zone, basically causing disturbance. Now I think a, a long time ago, people used to think that these beasts lived in the forest. Well, they did, but they didn't just live in the forest, they drove forest ecology. You know, a herd of these big beasts, look at that bison on the left there. Um, the one at the right hand end, that's the normal sized American bison. That's not small. The one on the left hand end, which I think was in the steppes of Russia, uh, if you had a herd of those going through the forest, it would leave some mark. Um, so you had these big beasts. And actually, if anything, this interglacial period, the big beasts we had roaming around were even smaller, were smaller even than the ones that were in the previous interglacial, where we had elephants in this part of the world. So the idea that we ha have big beasts roaming through the forest actually having an impact, you know, that's the natural state of the northern temperate zone. Big beasts having a big impact. The problem, of course, is most of them are extinct. And actually, even the ones that aren't extinct, you may not want because they're rather large and rather vicious. So the idea that we can just bring back lost species and restore this, the natural processes or the natural process of grazing and browsing uh, using wild species doesn't really work. We can't really do it. What we can do, what we can actually do, a phrase I use quite a lot, is we can actually bring back proxies of wild animals. These are domestic proxies of wild animals. And these are the, this is the mix of animals uh, that we get in the Nepa state. And I'll just mention a few of my favorite ones. You can see the, the array there. These are, the point here is that mostly these are, they are domestic animals, right? Well, they have, they are treated in the same, or we have the same responsibility that we do have for domestic animals, but they're not wild animals, with exceptions like rabbits and roe deer, but mostly these are animals which are domestic, but they are proxies to wild animals. And here's a couple of examples. So we have the, um, the Tamworth pig. The Tamworth pig stands in for the wild boar. The wild equivalent would be the wild boar. Now we brought the Tamworth pigs in there and very, very quickly, these domestic animals start to behave just like their wild ancestors. Now we didn't know how much a pig plowed. One sow can plow 40 acres in a year. Uh, part of NEP where, where this rewilding is done is about 800 acres. There are only six pigs in 800 acres because of the impact they have. Plus their, plus their piglets. And you can see what they do here. They shovel things around. They behave like hippos. They actually manage to find grubs and things underwater, which we didn't know about. Uh, they, they do have a massive driving impact. They don't just live in forests. They are actually a driving force of forests. Other animals, the heavy hitters, the deer. There are three species of deer at NEP. This is the red deer. There's also the fallow deer and roe deer pass through. And these have a big effect. We didn't know how much they liked water, so they keep the waterways open as well. Um, yes, they graze and browse, but they also have other effects, like they're fighting and jousting. You know, they open up areas by simply the fact of them pouring the ground and attacking each other and defending an area. It has an impact on, on, that, on, on, the, on the landscape. Other species, the ponies. Um, all of these things graze and behave in different ways when they're given the opportunity to do so. They choose what they eat, different times in their life cycle, different times of the year. So therefore, they have a different effect on the landscape. They're not just forced to eat one species of grass. And if you look at these, they're actually being quite selective in what they eat. Sometimes of the year, they'll choose very twiggy things. At other times of the year, they'll go for much more lush grassland. So they all behave in different ways. And, and in a rewilding project, they're, they're allowed to. They're not just forced into eating lush grass. And my personal favourite are the English longhorn cows. Um, these are great. They're, you know, they look big and savage, but they're pussy cats. They're really, really nice. And here we see, it's not just true that cows spend all day eating green grass. They don't. Look at, look at this. They're all choosing, in this case, to eat very twiggy materials, which they do at certain times of the year. They do naturally go for a balanced diet. They browse as much as graze. 
and they have other effects. Like the deer, they, they rub their horns or their antlers up and down the trees, which can kill some of the trees and can end up reopen the forest. So you've got all this going on. Right, so let's have a look at this kind of model that you, a lot of you have probably had in your mind. You think of the idea we have new habitat, uh, and you go through this process of, of succession, you know, little trees turn into big trees, and then you get into a habitat. And then if that carries on, you end up going to climax forest. And um, I guess a lot of you heard the phrase climax forest, and you probably heard the phrase climatic climax forest. This was an idea that until the 1960s kind of held sway, that was supposed to be the end point, that the idea for every climate zone, there was a climax forest that it headed towards. Yes, but it's only part of the story. It's not the end point. What actually happens is, yes, that's part of the equation, but you have this more cyclic arrangement where natural disturbance is turning the clock back on succession all the time. It's actually multiple scale and multiple time scale. This is just a simplistic representation. And what causes disturbance? Well, grazing and browsing is one of the, the, the uh, agents of natural disturbance. The next question, I suppose, there's a couple of questions left. That is, well, what affects the grazing and browsing? Uh, what, what actually impacts on these animals which are driving disturbance? Well, of course, it's the top predators. And there's another, another um, natural process here, I suppose, which is the ecology of fear. I guess some of you have heard about this, you know, the, the idea that big grazing animals, well, any, any herbivore is affected by the existence of predators in the landscape. If you're, if you're a deer and you know there are wolves around, you behave in a very different way than, than if you're feeling safe. And in fact, one of the biggest problems in nature conservation isn't overgrazing or undergrazing, it's even grazing. If a whole landscape is grazed evenly, grazed evenly, then actually it's much less diverse than if there's difference. And the ecology of fear drives animals to move on. It drives them to avoid some areas. In, in Yellowstone Park, when they brought back the wolves, they found that the deer avoided the edges of rivers. That's where they were ambushed. But the result, the edges of rivers regenerated. And what they, they didn't even realize how degraded the riverbanks were until they started to regenerate. It's an example of how fear drives ecology. And that's relayed in all sorts of different ways. So the ecology of fear is a driving force, which we generally don't have in this country. So, you know, you can identify natural processes which are actually absent we have to think about. The last natural process I'm going to mention actually is cut, it cuts across the whole thing and that's hydrology. So what I'm basically saying is that this, this in red writing here, they are, they are the four forms of natural process that we can probably think about when we're thinking about um, rewilding. Here we are. So the idea that succession is going in one direction, natural disturbance is going in another, in another it's kind of moderated or impacted by the ecology of fear. But on top of that, you've got landform, hydrology, the way the water flows, the way, the way hydrology works. There are probably many others as well. We could talk about nutrient cycling, energy flow, all those sorts of things. But I think this kind of captures what the natural processes are that drive ecology and drive rewilding. Okay, let's move on. So, right, okay, so you've got the natural processes working. You've got the succession fighting with, with natural disturbance. That should give you rich and diverse vegetation structures. And if you go to, go to NEP, this is the sort of thing you'll see. In close proximity, you've got trees struggling to get going, probably be browsed, probably be killed, right next because of the browsing of impact. So this is oak, probably a lot older than it looks. Right next door to that, though, you've got spiny shrubs. You've got roses, hawthorn, uh, blackthorn, all sorts of things acting as natural defences to the, to the oak. So you see the oaks, in this case, are starting to emerge through the, I think in this case, rose shrubs, and that forms a natural barrier. So you're starting to see a kind of um, patchwork, very close grained patchwork of some areas with open trees where, which die, and therefore you have grazing land. And in, in between that, you'll see other areas where the trees are being protected, coincidentally by spiny shrubs, and they're getting away. So you're starting to see the idea of groves of trees emerging within a grazed environment. Now those groves of trees could be any, any sort of size. Here they're one or two trees, but you can see much larger groves being defended by spiny shrubs. This is the sort of matrix you see developing in the net rewilding project. And this is what it looks like in, you know, in after a while, you see a ring of, I think in this case it's gorse actually, surrounding an oak tree, which has got away 
then it's going to be a future, you know, big open grown oak tree. But it answers all sorts of questions. A lot of the biodiversity that lives on oak trees, and oak trees have the highest number of insects of any species in this country, a lot of the biodiversity that, li that relies on these trees needs these trees growing in open conditions. There was a bit of a myth that oak forest harboured all of these oak species. Well, it doesn't. Uh, it does harbour some, but mostly these species need open grown oak trees. Now that's where you get the greatest biodiversity. And that's not explained by dense forests. So this, is, this sort of pattern enables the future development of open grown oak trees, patches of scrub, patches of dense woodland, patches of grassland, uh, but all growing in close proximity, in massive complexity. And here's an aerial photograph of, um, of NEP. This area here is an old oak wood. It's actually an, it's an ancient wood. If you, come, if you come, I'll take you there. That's an, that's an oak wood, an, an ancient woodland, at least 400 years old, probably a lot older. Uh, the area to the right, that was arable land 15 years ago. And what we've found is that the trees have spread, bees have planted the acorn, mice have dragged nuts in and so on, wind-blown trees like birch have all established. We're going against that, You've got browsers and grazers with this dynamic relationship, basically keeping it open. So the tree's trying to grow, the grazer's trying to eat them, and you get this patchwork. Everything you can, that you can see there, even the little wiggly path, I think was created by herbivores. So you get this patchwork evolving. Uh, and of course, you've also got pigs behaving like wild boar, opening up these areas, bringing the, the mineral soil to the surface, and starting another form of natural disturbance, followed by natural succession. You've got all this going on. And we used to call this a matrix or a shifting matrix. The far better word for this is actually a kaleidoscope, a shifting habitat. Remember those old kaleidoscopes, you look down, you see all the, all the patterns and shapes changing and the colours changing. It's much more like that than a, than a fixed matrix. A kaleidoscope, a shifting habitat. That seems to be what, what this sort of process creates. Okay, so what the natural processes, you got your rich vegetation. One phrase that you probably know the, the professor John Lawton is a very well-known um, professor who develops you know, ideas of landscape ecology. Uh, he, his phrase was, species keep you honest. You can have all the most wonderful theories in the world, but if it's not reflected in what's happening to the species, you've got something wrong. So, okay, we've done all this stuff at NEP, we've brought back the natural processes, we've got the vegetation structures, but what are the species telling us? Are we actually getting more species there? Are we actually getting the kind of diversity of different suites of species? Or is it just kind of a bit of a mess and nothing's responding? But what we found is, of course, there's been masses of surveys done there and the biodiversity has responded incredibly. What we're finding, this, this, this is now old data, uh, over 30,000 records have been collected of over 3,000 species. Um, by comparison, that's about the same number as most of our nature reserves have. And this was farmland 15 years ago, it's nowhere special. So about 3,000 species. Notable species, uh, biodiversity action plan species, red list, data, red, red, red list birds, for example, this woodcock down the bottom there, and um, they're breeding on site. So yes, we're getting a lot of species there and a lot of really quite interesting species as well. It's not just kind of weed species that come and go. We are getting the species there. We haven't yet seen any fall off in, in, in things which are kind of losing, things aren't losing out, but things are coming in, which is, which is quite odd. Um, there must be a balance met, met at some stage. And also NEP is turning out to be a national hotspot for all sorts of species. Cuckoo, for example, its numbers are building up there. Little Dove, which is in, in Sussex, I think throughout Britain, it's one of the most fastest declining birds. 98% loss, I think, since 1990. Uh, there were thoughts there might be some in NEP. There are now 16 singing males. Only with nightingales, there was one singing male, I think, at the start of the project. It says 19 there. I think the recent figure is that there's now nearly 30. Um, so all of these things are coming along. The purple emperor butterfly, we didn't even know it was there at all. Um, it might have dropped in. It's now the most important site in Britain for purple emperor butterflies. It's got huge numbers of species there, huge, huge numbers of the butterfly there. The point I want to make here, though, which is quite important, Traditional nature conservation, and I'm not saying that's the, uh, you know, I'm not saying that's wrong or anything. Traditional nature conservation would identify what's important, and then build a management plan to look after what's important, and that's completely the right thing to do in most cases. But that's not what happens in rewilding projects. What happens here 
it's a, a system is rebuilt. We re rebuild the natural processes. We recharge the ecosystem. What happens is an emergent property. There is no management plan for cuckoos. There's no management plan for Barbastel bat. There certainly isn't a management plan for purple emperor, but they're all important. And what this is, this, this is the emergent property from a rebuilt system. It's not the objective delivered by management. A critical difference, uh, neither is right or wrong. They're in the right place at the right time. But, but it is a critical difference between rewilding, which is about emergent properties, having rebuilt a system, and traditional approaches, traditional management, which is about recognizing what's important and rebuilding and delivering the objective, both important. Okay, that's well, okay. So we seem to be doing okay. We seem to be getting our species back again. Actually, in spades, there's masses of uh, re rejuvenation in, in the Nepa state, which after all, 20 years ago was a pretty ordinary farm with nothing particularly outstanding there. It wasn't unpleasant, it was quite a good farm, but it was certainly not outstanding. It is now. Okay, so the species are there. Um, but is the ecosystem functioning in a way? Is it is it a better ecosystem, whatever that means? Now, this is this is a big subject. I'm not going to speak very long about it. Um, but there's a lot of work going on to work out, well, what do we mean by ecosystem function? How do you measure it? How do you say whether something something's performing better or not? Biodiversity, the species, that gives you a very good clue. Um, but actually, there's more to it than that. But actually, perhaps the best way to find out about this, to see whether it's actually functioning or not, is, well, it's all in the soil. Um, if your soil is functioning well, if your soil is building up, then the odds are your ecosystem is functioning pretty well. And the point of that net is, this is being closely monitored, um, as other uh, um, rewilding projects have, and we're finding that the soil is recovering far faster than anyone predicted. So for example, there are places right next door to net which can end up in the rewilding project so they act as a control. You can compare what happened in NEP with some land which as far as we can tell is on a similar in, in a similar kind of biome. So what's the difference? What's what's changed? Well in just 15 years soil carbon has more than doubled. Now I don't think we realized that was possible. You know more than double the amount of carbon in the soil, more than double the amount of organic matter in the soil. There are apparently there are soil microbe biomarkers that you can watch, uh, and these are recovering. Um, I heard a statistic a while ago, which is so amazing, I can't forget it. I, you know, the question is, well, what does a recovered soil look like? And the soil scientist told me that if you take a gram of soil, which is a bit less than a spoonful, I think, in that gram of soil, there could be 10,000 species of microbe, 10 billion individuals, and more individuals than there are people on Earth, 10 billion individuals, and 50 kilometers of fungal thread. Can you imagine that? 50 kilometers of fungal thread in a spoonful of soil. I was, you know, that's what a real soil ecosystem looks like. I don't know who counted them, but there we go, another, another job. Um, also, of course, looking at, uh, well, what drives some of this? And dung beetles are really important in this ecosystem. And comparing NEP with an organic site, um, you can see this is numbers of individuals um, in, the, in a sample. NEP nearly had 12,000 species, sorry, 12,000 individuals in the sample, whereas an, a comparable organic site had about 600. Now you could say that's perhaps not a fair comparison because the organic site may not have had the same kind of um, interaction with animals. But actually it makes the point, rewilding, interaction with animals, the importance of dung, the buildup of carbon in the soils, it's all, it's all linked and it's all an indication of the functionality of that ecosystem. Um, so what's the importance of soil? What's the functional importance of soil? Well, it's, it's pretty obvious, I'm sure we all realise. Amelioration of water, throw as it, water flow as it goes through the soil, the enhanced stability, reduced erosion, the aeration and permeability of the soil, uh, infiltration rate, the way may water seeps into the soil rather than washing straight off. That's all improved if you have a functional soil. Um, Obviously, it's a rooting growth. It's a rooting medium for, for, for plants. So that's important as well. So soil has a functional importance, reflects the functional functionality of the ecosystem. I suppose, linking to what I said earlier, rewilding is actually a way of thinking. It's not just a definition. It's not just a particular thing. It's a way of thinking, which is actually in, in fullest extent, fundamentally different from traditional, what are called traditional conservation, just for want of a name. 
And as I said before, it's process led. Rewilding is actually about putting the processes back in place and as much as possible, allowing nature to take its course. So that non, you know, low intervention. So it's, it's about, it has to be large scale. So it's about putting processes back in place, trying to do as non-intervention as possible and allowing things to evolve in their own way. So emergent properties, that's rewilding. However, the other approach is to is more outcome led where you're looking at you could be looking at natural processes but actually your management is copying natural processes and delivering an outcome delivering an objective which is something that is important on that side uh, which is a different approach that's traditional sympathetic nature conservation management so these are two different approaches um they're right in the right places i I'm certainly don't subscribe to the view that one is right and the other one is wrong uh, they're both two sides of the same coin and can inform each other. So they're, so they're quite important. And as you can probably spot, they overlap actually in practice. In, in nature conservation, we were well before rewilding. We were thinking about natural processes and how they actually work and how we can restore them. OK, so where would you and where wouldn't you do rewilding? There's sometimes a bit of a view that um, it's the art that we must do it everywhere. Well, we should consider it everywhere, yes, but I think it's, there's more to it than that. And actually, here are some of the considerations. If you're doing something radical like rewilding an area, you should probably do it on land of least risk. because We don't really know what rewilding is in practice. We don't know what the wild is. There's so much unknown, unknown about it. So do it on land of least risk where there's no or very little special sensitive wildlife. Um, sometimes the sensitive wildlife is linked to the way um, past management has worked. You'd probably do it on land of low agricultural value. Doing it on high agricultural value land is, is, is well, it's a bit of a risk of agricultural productivity. There's plenty of low, low, low value land out there as well. If, you're, if your objective is forestry, then you would do forestry, you wouldn't do rewilding. But if there's land with a clear objective, that is probably where you wouldn't do nature conservation. Those objectives might be agriculture, forestry, but they could be biodiversity. Your objective may actually be to look after, um, for example, looking after a bitterns in a reed bed. So therefore you have an objective. So it's probably not where you do rewilding. So there's a right place and a wrong place to do rewilding. Scale. The question we're always asked in these courses is how big does a place need to be to be rewilded? How big should a rewilding project be? My answer to that is it's the wrong question. If you can't think of a good answer, then you should always question the question. And that, that isn't the question. The question is, what is the area needed to support the ecological process you're trying to restore? And that gives you, give you a better handle on the size you may need. Now, I'm going to talk you through this, starting big and ending up small, because it's fun apart from anything else. So let's start big, about, you know, all natural processes, starting right at the top of the tree. What's the area required to support um, predators. What's the areas required to support a population of lynx? Well, the lynx has the biggest territory of any cat in the world. <laughs> You're going to need a big area. Uh, if, you, if you want to get the ecology of fear back working and you want a viable population of the top predators that drive it, you're going to need a big area. And to get these things back, all these chaps, you're going to need a, a vast area. Somebody said once, if you introduce wolves to Scotland, you should tell the people of Cornwall that they're on the way, because you do need a huge area. You need, you need regions to bring back your top predators. I'm not ruling it out at all, because the same principle also works for some of the lower predators, but you need large areas, obviously. You're going to need whole regions, hundreds of square kilometres. Maybe that's not on the card for this country, but let's not write it off entirely. So you need large areas. OK, moving down a bit, let's think about interacting wild herds. Uh, this is Ospardus plasen in the Netherlands, uh, where these animals are treated as wild. They're not domestic proxies. They're, they're left to sort it out for themselves, which is controversial. Um, what area do you need to have herds? There's no top predators here, which is another thing. Uh, but how big an area do you need to have all these herds interacting with each other? It is a wild auroch equivalent. Um, there's also ponies there, cony ponies and red deer, all interacting with each other. How big an area do you need? You need a vast area again. By the way, the wild auroch, do you know the wild, wild auroch? It's an extinct form of cow that our cows came from. Um, the wild auroch, if you imagine the biggest cow you can imagine, probably something like a charolais, 
Uh, put six inches on the shoulder to make it bigger and give it a really bad attitude. That's a wild auroch. And there were herds of these things roaming around Britain um, pre-Roman. This is a bred back version of it. You don't want to go too close to these things, but they're not, not as big and not as savage as a true wild auroch would have been. So if you've got wild herds of these things around, you need a vast area. You've got these interacting animals like wild boar as well. If you're going to have a viable population of wild boar, with all the disturbance I talked about earlier, again, you're going to need a large area. With all these things interacting, um, some of these things we may get back again. Bison, it's thought, weren't present in this country in this interglacial, but they were in Europe and that's the same ecology. Um, if you've got all these things interacting, you need a big area. You're going to need at least 10,000 hectares, probably more. As far as plus is 6,000 hectares, it's probably not big enough. So you need a vast area. Maybe that's off the cards for, for Britain, certainly at the moment. <clears throat> Move down a scale. Let's think about these domestic proxies. These are our nice friendly animals that we're used to. Um, yes, they are domestic. We are responsible for them. We have to make sure they don't suffer, which is fine. Um, but so they're not wild. But very quickly they learn to react to, to behave in a very wild way. Um, and then you're getting a little bit more flexible. You can actually have a smaller site. You can start to make sure these things are working. The level of intervention you have to put in goes up because you're actually, to some extent, managing these populations. There's no, no intensive management here, but you're watching them, you're being careful, you're making sure things are okay. Um, you're probably going to need something like a thousand he hectares. More would be better, but uh, the block in, in, in NEP I was talking about is only 800 hectares. The whole of NEP is three and a half thousand acres. Um, I'm getting the acres and hectares muddled up, aren't I? The, the, this is hectares. Um, the block in NEP is only 800 hectares. The whole estate is about 1,500 hectares. Okay, so you need about 1,000 hectares, really. If you go down a scale again, and okay, so you want your grazers and browsers there all through the year, but maybe you haven't got the space for all these interacting properties. You're going to need to have a, you can get by with a smaller area, maybe a few hundred hectares. We're starting to get to the size of a normal nature reserve. And there's a change in attitude. Large scale, we're thinking about, well, what size do we need for the processes? Small scale, we're thinking, well, how do we manage the process at the scale that we actually have? Okay, going down a scale again, smaller areas, you have to manage the disturbance to fit the space that you have. And it starts to look a little bit like more normal nature conservation. You may have layback land, areas where you put your animals because they can't be on site all the time. You've got naturalistic grazing, like with these belted galloways down at the, in the bottom here, where, where it's a more like a rewilding project, but you may have to take the, the animals on and off the land according to how, how big the site is and whether it can hold them all through the year. We do that in the Sussex Wildlife Trust on some of our nature reserves. We get very similar outcomes to NEP, but on much smaller sites because we're trying to copy rewilding. You may only have a few tens of hectares, maybe less. And what about if you've got a very small place, you can't get any animals in there, then you have to do the rewilding yourself and pretend to be these animals. You have to pretend to be a, um, I don't know, you have to pretend, pretend to be a bison and go there and cut stuff. You have to pretend to be a, um, um, a wild auroch and go there with your reciprocating cutter and, and, and graze an area. You could say there are three different rationales for this sort of management. A long time in the past, this was about getting a product because it was commercially viable. In the more recent past, it was about delivering a conservation outcome with traditional nature conservation. You could now say that actually what we're doing now is re reproducing or, create or recreating a natural process. So we're, we're pretending to be a natural process. There's a different rationale again. But actually notice it's the same management. We've got three different rationales. And also, let's not forget uh, the grazers that are probably ro ro roaming around anyway. Some urban rewilding projects are quite small, but pretty effective, because actually there's so ma many native grazers going through there anyway, they're creating the diversity without any need for kind of hands-on management. Okay, a few hectares. Other, other factors influence size, geographical variety, hydrological variety. If you've got a lot of that in a small space, you can have a smaller project. Also productivity, highly productive areas, or more productive areas, you can fit bigger populations of animals into a smaller place. So the south, south, the south of England can have smaller rewilding projects than the north of Scotland, where productivity is lower. 
Okay, I should thought I'd drop this this diagram in here because this may be relevant to, to some of you who are thinking um, about rewilding in a local context with local local sites. What we tend to do with our small sites is we have a management objective. It's quite correct. So at the bottom there is what we tend to do. Um, if you have a large landscape, a rewilding project, um, you haven't got a specific objective. It's, you know, no rewilding project is big enough and complete enough to leave it completely alone. So what we do there is we have limits of acceptable change. We try to make them as wide as possible so nature can move and change and be dynamic, but we also have to watch to make sure that it's within limits of acceptable change. There's always decisions to be made. What we can do is halfway up this scale is where is, as nature reserves, for example, get bigger, um, then you can start to have multiple objectives. You can manage for multiple objectives. It's bigger still, you can start to have adaptive management, fluid objectives, change your mind every now and then as things change and evolve and become dynamic. I think sometimes in nature conservation, we've tended to stay at the bottom end of this. We tended to want to have very specific objectives and deliver them. Very often that's completely correct. But actually, as we're rebuilding systems, we could perhaps be more fluid, more multiple objectives, start to have limits of limits of acceptable change rather than narrow objectives. So I'll leave that perhaps as a challenge, you know, the way we can actually think in nature conservation. Okay, this is just a little bit of a, a graph that uh, again actually comes from Professor Lawton on Lawton, plotting the size of sites against management intensity. And uh, down at the bottom right then, you, you've got huge sites with low management intensity. The top left, you've got smaller sites with high management intensity. Most of our sites are in the top left, uh, but the really big sites are in the bottom right. You can see net there in the middle, where we're trying to get a bigger site and lower the management intensity. So that's rewilding. Um, I'd like to take you to net one day. That would be great fun. But, uh, Thank you very much for having me. And uh, if there are any questions, I'm very happy to answer them. Well, thank, thank you very you. much. Over, over to you, <laughs> Christina. Well, yeah. So thank you, Tony. That's been really excellent. Lots of thought there, things to think about, certainly. Um, so has anyone got questions? Anyone like to ask um, Tony anything? Ched there. Yeah, Ched, carry on. Hi, Tony. Um, based on some things I know quite a bit about to things I don't know anything about. <laughs> I was interested in a bit about the dung beetles. Mm. You've obviously got a mix of animals there. Presumably the ones that are looked after well do not receive any ivermectins or anything to kill the narcissists that come out in the dung. Yeah. Is the situation working because you have a a balance of animals that have different parasites or is it because of a low density or can you comment on what the helminth situation is in these animals? Yes it's a very good question and there's a lot lot to that. They are lowish densities of animals, they are not treated with, with chemicals um, at all if we can get away with it, in fact they're very healthy animals so they don't need treating, we can't use ivermectin. Uh, there's a vet very closely watching us because net's known about and we can't have things going wrong. So it's very well followed by, by a vet. So, no, we don't have the, the chemicals and we don't have the ivermectin in, in, um, interfering with that, that dung cycle. Um, we do have a mix of animals um, and the way they interact with their vegetation seems to be important. Um, that's, and we're monitoring the actual species as well, rather than, as well as the actual numbers. And so, for example, we've had. Um, I'm not a, a coleopterist, so I don't know the details, but we had, for example, violent door beetle, um, which I think is a, a, a rare dung beetle thought to be extinct in Sussex, which came back. And now it seems to be in quite high numbers there. So it seems there are, there's now a, a, um, a suite of species associated with dung, which seems to be coming back and doing its ecological thing. So it does all seem to be working together and it does all seem to be linked. It's not, I don't think it's one thing or the other. It's not just the absence of chemicals, and it's not just the mixed mix, mix animals that are there, and it's not just the interaction with, with vegetation. It's all of it working together. Good, thanks. Yeah. Hey, has anyone else got any questions? <laughs> How close to rewilding are some of your sites in, in, in Rice? Yeah, so that's what I was going to say. Quite a lot of us on this call um, are involved with different, different reserves, I think, um, 
all of us on different ones. Um, and I'm sure it's given us lots to think about, about those reserves that we, um, we actually help manage. Um, for me, I mean, my local one is Maple Lodge. And a few things you've said have made me think about it because, well, firstly, we have a lot of trouble with loss of understory. Um, and that's due to wild deer. There's a lot of deer, muntjac particularly, um, that are causing that. Um, then also the, the walk we went, the Natural History Society did a walk last weekend and we went to Hodgemore Wood. And one of our comments as we were walking through the wood, there the understory is mostly holly. Now, would you think that leaving holly is actually a good thing? Because most reserves, and I know uh, Ryslick Woods particularly, they, they would try and remove as much as the holly as possible. But maybe from what you say, it'd be a good thing to leave it. It's, it's such an interesting question because um, I'll answer it in a slightly different way. If, if you go to NEP, what you tend to see is the, um, uh, that, that evolution that I told you about, where you get these, these, these groves of trees evolving. But what you'll also get to find, if you go into the ancient woodland that's there, is it, it's being eaten away. But it's all, you, know, you can see through it, like in your worst example of an ancient woodland, and you think, oh, yeah. isn't that terrible? And actually by itself, it is terrible. But what we're finding is that the ancient woodland plants are reducing, but they're not disappearing. But what we're finding is that those ancient woodland plants, that, which elsewhere don't colonize, are appearing in the scrub next door. So it seems that what we've got in, in a functioning landscape is a shifting mosaic. Now, we don't usually have that in our, in our nature reserves or in our landscape. You only have the bit that you've got to look after. You can't afford to lose that and you, you haven't got the dynamic process. Mm. So something like holly is usually a, um, a, a rebound after grazing stops. So you see it in the new forest, you get holly coming up and then it forms this dense kind of, I think they're called ringwood in, in, in the new forest, which tends to exclude things. And eventually a couple of hundred years later, they fall apart. They literally fall apart and you get something growing up in the middle. That, that's great as a natural process. But actually, in most nature reserves, most landscapes, you haven't got that dynamic to actually have all the stages that you'd need to have all your biodiversity. So therefore, you have to manage. Mm. Uh, and you, you just get the question, what do you do with it? Maybe, well, the thing about management is you can get a port into a pint pot. So you can get more diversity into a small space than would happen naturally. And that's just as well, because that's what you need to do on small sites. So you're, you're brought back into having to manage. You can pretend to be a natural process of some sort. You know, have a go with it and pretend that you're being a fighting fighting deer or something. You can pretend yeah. to be a natural process. Yeah, so I suppose that's it. I suppose most of us, most of the reserves that most of us manage, they're, they're too small to be completely natural. Absolutely. Therefore, this no, is yeah. why we, we have to manage them ourselves. Yeah, yeah. So that well, makes sense. Way, way too, yeah, all places are way too small. And one thing I didn't say earlier, which I should have mm. said, is that... Uh, Rewilding is not the same as abandonment. In some no. people, it's not mm. the same at all. Um, abandonment is a, a passive letting things go to whatever you know, whatever state it was in. Rewilding mm. is a positive decision. It may involve abandonment in some places, but it's not the same thing as abandonment. You have to yeah. positively think about what natural processes should be working there. Therefore, mm. what are you going to do about it? Yeah. So another another point that came up. That I thought about while you were talking. So we were talking about um, obviously dung beetles and, and your cattle and, and leaving them naturally. But do you have do you have to manage it to remove things like ragwort? Because obviously, you know, where I've had thing horses, it's always this big thing, and on the reserves about oh we should remove ragwort. And then there's always this debate about oh it should look after itself as long as you haven't got animals eating it, or they should recognise it as long as it's not cut, mm. that sort of thing. So do you have oh. that problem at NEP oh. or not? Ragwort discussion is, is amazing, yes. Um, <laughs> it's a sea of yellow some years. It's completely covered with ragwort and we have no ragwort poisoning. Right. Literally none. There's no hint of ragwort poisoning anywhere. Animals aren't as stupid as all that. They know not to eat it. Um, yeah. It's a controversy for several reasons. First of all, um, people were accusing NEP of allowing it to blow onto their land, which is a fair criticism. So being a big landowner, of course, he got the, um, the national expert on ragwort on his advisory committee. And I didn't realise that ragwort actually doesn't colonise very far. It only colonises about 50 or 70 metres. Um, apparently, if you've got ragwort, it's probably the seed already in the soil. The stuff that blows around probably isn't viable. That's why it's light. 
Um, so to answer the criticism, he mowed an area 100 metres wide around the edge of the state to answer the criticism. Fine, but the trouble is, what we have to realise is that people sometimes see ragwort as a, um, um, as a bad thing anyway. It's, it's a sign you're getting it all wrong. Mm. So, so you have you have that kind of uh, emotional thing to go go with. Actually, there are so there, this has come up in, with several species. Ragwort certainly came up with creeping thistle. There's masses of creeping thistle. Eventually, it sorted itself and 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 died down. But again, it was referred to. Nep was referred to as the biggest weed farm in Sussex. So there's these these kind of perceptions that you have to fight your way through. But no ragwort. Uh, we're now seeing this as a very important plant. It's a big nectar source at a major time of the year, and it seems that it supports a lot of things. You can see the cycle of nectar going through the year at NEP because it's evolving the way natural systems would have evolved. Mm, mm, that's interesting. Yeah. Right. Um, the other question I was going to ask you actually is you, you mentioned about beavers. Is there any thoughts to bring beavers back at NEP, or is that? Oh, yes. Oh yes, we're going to have beavers back again. We're absolutely, going. we did try once. You may have known that they were brought. They were brought in, and we had a particular fencing strategy, um, which, let's be, be fair, failed dismally, and the things got out. <laughs> um, <laughs> bad news is they got out, and they weren't supposed to, because that's part of the license. Good news though, they escaped. One of them escaped into a fishing lake, and the fishermen loved it. They didn't want to give <laughs> it back again. The other one went the other way. The beavers didn't like each other, it turned it out, turned out, but never mind. The other one went the other way, went downstream and appeared in the middle of again of a farmer's field and was chewing up everything in the farmer's field. And he was delighted as well and is insisting that he was involved in the next re re release programme. So we had masses of, uh, of I think there was something like 70% of the responses were highly positive, and about 15% were antagonistic. A vast majority, including landowners and fishermen and all the people who've been told would be against it, very, very positive. So there were good sides to it, um, mm. but we haven't, so there is a plan to get beavers back again. It shouldn't be too long now. Yeah, oh, that's interesting. That's good to know. Yeah. Well, thank you ever so much. I don't know if anyone else has any more questions that they want to, to add or no. Right, I think we'll, uh, we'll say thank you. I don't know if we can all show our appreciation by showing a clap. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Maybe Bye. see you physically one day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye. So we we'll call the meeting closed then, Christina. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Bye. Thank you very much for everyone's attendance.